This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Miranda Janelle, Justin Zellers, and Pepper Giese. Coming up on DTNS, the latest from Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, including wireless AR headsets, scrollable screens, and the rise of satellite connections for your cell phone. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, February 27th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From the not Ohio, I'm the show's producer, <laughs> Roger Chang. Uh, yeah, good, good, good Ohio represent. Uh, we just need someone from Cincinnati. We'd have the whole state covered. The C trifecta. Really? Yeah. Uh, we are running out of February. I don't know if anyone noticed this. We are almost out of February. So I don't know if we want to restock or replace it with March. You let me know. <laughs> um, while we decide that, let's start with the quick hits. If you don't use Spotify, you may not care about this, but some folks who do have found this change to the service to be monumental. The heart icon for favoriting songs has been replaced on Spotify by a plus symbol. Tap that plus icon once, it'll save a song or podcast to your library. Tap it again, and you can add it to a playlist. Non-Spotify fans can now move along from this, but Spotify fans, we're thinking of you during this change. Meta announced it's funding a service from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children called Take It Down. It's created a tool to help people younger than 18 stop intimate images of themselves from spreading online. The tool will make a hash of an offending image on the user's device, and only the hash will be submitted online. That's a big deal. A hash is a mathematical formula that can identify a file without being a copy of that file. You don't have to share the file, just the hash. That hash can be used to uh, that, the game, that hash can then be used to find copies of the image and take them down. Over the weekend, The Verge and platformer Zoe Schiffer reported that Twitter laid off uh, at least 50 people. New York Times was reporting it was up to 200. These included prominent product manager Esther Crawford, who had become famous as the defender of Twitter Blue, uh, as well as product manager Martin DeKuyper, the founder of the now-shuttered Review newsletter platform, which Twitter acquired in 2021. Employees of Dish Networks told Bleeping Computer that an outside bad actor, a known threat agent, had attacked Dish systems this week. Dish Network began experiencing a major outage on February 23rd. Eventually, it impacted everything from Dish.com, the Dish Anywhere app, call centers, and even authentication services. Users could not access accounts or stream online over the weekend. That seems to have been resolved, but as of today, its main website is, um, remains offline. As China's government cracks down on Chinese companies using U.S.-made AI like ChatGPT, more companies are joining in on launching their own homegrown versions. So can't use OpenAI? Let's make our own. Reuters sources say Tencent began working on its own generative AI chatbot called Hunyan Aid, based on its Hunyan training model. South China Morning Post reported that model achieved better than humans for the first time on the Chinese language understanding evaluation evaluation test back in November. That is a test that tests how a computer can understand and respond to Chinese text. And that is the quick hits. All right, Snap, speaking of AI, can use ChatGPT, and it has. It has made a chatbot that they call my AI available to $4 a month Snapchat Plus subscribers. Uh, runs a version of ChatGPT trained to follow Snap's trust and safety guidelines, and it is restricted. So this isn't open to whatever question you want to ask it. You try to get it to write an academic paper, it's going to say no. It's restricted to certain kinds of responses. Uh, it seems to be meant to be used like a virtual friend that you can just say hi to and chat with. Uh, it even has an alien Bitmoji profile icon. Snap eventually plans to make it available to all users. ChatGPT is a tool to generate text responses to prompts, so it doesn't have to be used for search uh, or writing academic papers. It, it, it can be restricted to whatever use you want to put it to. Uh, we talked about this a lot with Justin Robert Young last week about how he uses it with Notion, and Notion is doing a, a little bit of ChatGPT with some other stuff to create an embedded version on their service. I think we're going to see a lot of embedded uses uh, like this. What do you think of this one, Rob? 
Well, I, I actually really like this. So, you know, one of the if, if, if you want to say there is a problem with, uh, you know, chat GPT, just the, you know, the open AI version of it is that it kind of can be all over the map. Well, what Snap is doing here is they're really directing its usage for the use case that they want it to be used for. So you, you're going to see probably less variance in, in responses. And it's it's not necessarily a you know, an idea that's looking for a use case, they've actually come up with a way, here's how we can use this and make this useful in our, you know, in our environment on our platform. So I kind of like what Snap is doing here. Yeah, I really like this idea of uh, these more specific versions of ChatGPT. Like we've we've seen what it can do as a, as just a general tool. I've I've almost referred to like the, the stuff that OpenAI hosts itself is almost just a tech demo. Uh, that is so generalized. You can do so much with it. You can do a ton with it, but really where it becomes like useful for productivity or for different very specific like verticals is when you get to these more specific ones. For Snap in particular, though, I do wonder if there is, I don't, I don't even want to say a danger. I don't even want to say that, but like they're personalizing. It's my AI. It has a face. It, I'm, supposed, I'm assuming it's going to have a tone uh, that goes with it as well. We've seen with the Bing search that that can get weird if you want to make it weird. And I know that these tools are kind of a reflection of the prompts that you give it. And it's been trained by Snap's systems. I think that gets a little potentially could be like well, well, Snap actually Snap actually put out a bunch of warnings about that, even though they yeah. have it restricted and they said we trained it under trust and safety guidelines. They pointed out like if you try, you can yes. make these things say stuff. And we know that. So please, you know, keep that in mind. If you try, you get what you try for. Uh and as you use it, it'll help us improve it. But what I think is fun for this is it almost feels like the evolution of like a Tamagotchi that you have in, in your pocket. Yes. Right? Like not necessarily like a This is a weird kind of one, thing. right? Yeah. Yeah. Like like you just something like, hey, I'm bored. I, I don't know. Let me talk to to my AI. Like I've I've gone through I've read all my chats in Snapchat. I but always I want to keep someone, chatting. Yeah, I always have someone that I want to chat with. I also wonder if this if if you know, I I know we mentioned this can't be used for search, but Snapchat is kind of a very amorphous product when it comes to like searchability of very different forms of content. And I wonder if they could have something where it's much more real time when it's specific to Snapchat itself and using that as a better tool to kind of surface different content. That's on no, there. That they might said be no search. To play. No, actually, no, I said no, no search. search. They, yeah, they, they never, <laughs> well, they never at, law, at, at launch. They're, but they're, they're, they're restricting it, it. They're restricting it from open uses. But all kidding aside, you're right. They might they they might throw something in like that uh, yeah, down, down the road. Down I the think, road. I, I think that's why this is kind of weird. Is that I think they're putting it in and going, eh, "Here's a toy. Play with it. We'll see what you use it for, and then that might inform what we do with it." Now, I don't see how this helps them monetize Snapchat Plus because they're saying like, like if you want to check this out, you could just be like in like a month, it'll be out or two months, you know, it'll be no, out. Well, and they've the said eventually audience. they want to give it to everyone. Yeah, I think they're no, putting it saying. in Snapchat so like, Plus. Yeah, yeah. Just like to if you keep want it. the fun to play with, to me, I'm like, <laughs> I oh, want to do a better it's job. It's the trust and safety. <laughs> it's the trust and safety that's keeping it in Snapchat Plus. They're like, we don't, yeah. we, we don't want too many people using it. We don't we want, want to see how you'll easy. break it first, and then we'll fix it, and then give exactly, it to exactly. And we want our paying customers to break it, not just anyone. <laughs> All right, let's get let's get to the Mobile World Congress stuff. Yeah, we had so much news coming out of Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. So here are some of the quick kind of look at some of the highlights here. Uh, so Rob, start us out here. We we saw like one of the big trends was uh, stuff coming out of China, right? So yes, there's lots of Chinese gears coming um, to Europe. Honor's Magic VS tablet to phone foldable will hit the continent starting in the UK in June. It starts at 1,599 pounds, folds completely flat, and claims a 400,000 fold related lifespan it's 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 a little pricey but at least they're giving you double the memory for its contemporary the uh, the galaxy fold it's, i believe this goes up to 512 whereas the galaxy fold is only 256 and double the folds of the galaxy fold too rated at least we'll see not ip rated though that's a big uh, a red flag for me though uh weirdly uh 1599 euros even though it's it's coming to the uk oh, they I gave said the pounds, price of euros right, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. No, it's confusing. Uh, Xiaomi also plans to bring its 13 phone series to Europe after a domestic release in December. So they released it in China in December. Now it's coming to Europe. That's the another theme. Phones are coming to Europe. Uh, this includes the 13 Pro, which offers flagship specs, standing out with a 1-inch 50-megapixel main camera and 120-watt wired fast charging. Shipping to Europe March 8th, starting at 1,200 euros. And the standard Xiaomi 13 and 13 Lite are also coming to the market. Uh, those are 999 and 499 euros, respectively. The phone maker HMD Global announced plans to spin up some phone manufacturing in Europe to meet a surge in customer demand, specifically citing security and sustainability concerns. No word on where they're going to build this manufacturing, but the company is headquartered in Finland and it moved its data centers there in 2019. So it has a significant presence there. Wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, not, not a bad time to announce your diversified supply chain plans. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, HMD sells Nokia branded phones, and at the show, it announced the Nokia G22, a 179-euro Android phone meant to be repaired at home. In collaboration with iFixit, HMD will offer repair guides and parts that can be used without voiding the warranty. Fixed kits for the Nokia G22 cost 5 euros, and the global average price for the parts are 49 euros 95 for a screen, 24 euros 95 for a battery, and 19 euros 95 for a charging port. I I have to ask is, is this really intended for tinkerers um this is not necessarily a high-end phone so i'm kind of wondering really who's going to be fixing a phone that's only 179 euros uh it's a beater phone right like you can you can give it to your kid <laughs> like like so you could give it to your kid and be like i don't use a case with it like beat it up and it's going to cost me you know uh, you know 50 is less than 180 right so you know, if yep. it's simple to do, if it's just, yeah. hey, I pull a pin out, I have to, you know, use the little guitar pick looking thing to open it up. If it's not that bad, I, I'm super interested in this, probably figuring out the supply chain, maybe to hopefully do it on more. No, I, I think you're right. It's the person who buys the $1,600 phone doesn't care about saving money. It's the person who buys the 179 euro phone that <laughs> yeah. cares about saving money. So they're the ones more likely to want to fix it. I had never thought about that. That's interesting. Uh, Nokia it's, itself lets HMD make and sell phones under its name, but Nokia still sells its own networking gear and has stacks of patents that it makes money off of. To remind everyone of that, Nokia announced a refreshed logo. Uh, it looks like it's in the Futura typeface or something similar with some letters missing in parts in a lighter shade of blue. Uh, the new logo does not change for the HMD made phones, just for the corporate version. So you can tell the difference between the two. I, it really it, it want to let look, you know they don't make phones anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks very enterprisey, is what I will say. Uh, it, it is mm. very like enterprise networking gear look and logo. That's all I'll say. Well, of course, it wouldn't be a big trade show without a few concepts, right? Well, Lenovo is here to play the game. They showed off a rollable ThinkPad concept, which starts as a 27, or excuse me, a set 12.7 inch laptop. It has a, a four by three screen, so pretty traditional, but that unrolls at the flip of a switch to a 15.3 inch eight by nine screen. So almost square. The screen is made by Sharp and Lenovo owned also Motorola showed a rollable smartphone concept. It starts out as a squat five inch 15 by nine screen unrolls to a 6.5 inch tall boy 22 by nine the display actually rolls around the bottom of the phone, providing a small secondary display when stowed away. Both of these very much prototypes like they wouldn't even let reviewers like pick up the laptop. No details <laughs> about things like battery life or even weight or when you can actually physically touch them them uh but some cool ideas one of the reviewers from the verge pointed out he couldn't even see the difference between he no one knew it was a rollable laptop until they pressed the button and it popped up just like sitting on a table it just looks like a regular laptop that's cool to me lenovo usually ships stuff so i'm i'm, I'm curious why they're so kg uh with these uh because uh this this fits right into their yogas and bendables and, and all that sort of thing makes me think they're they're not quite ready for general use especially if you can't pick one up yourself <laughs> like, like just, literally pick it up off the table i mean not just at the store these things just mean we're closer to those night those late 90s early 2000 sci-fi shows to where your phone is just like something you just grab it and you just slide it open and you've got yes. massive amounts of screen so we're getting closer to that finally yeah 
So Xiaomi showed off its wireless AR glass discovery edition concept, which sort of looks like sunglasses and don't require a cable to connect to your phone. It uses the Snapdragon, excuse me, the Snapdragon XR2 Gen 1 SoC, supports hand tracking and mapping using three forward facing cameras, uses advanced materials like carbon fiber to keep the weight to only 126 grams and offers a pair of micro OLED displays that can hit up to 120 nits of brightness. And the lenses turn black to stop light from coming in when you're using for something like watching a movie. XDA developers got a hands on on the concept, but refer to them as the Explorer edition instead of Discovery. But specs and looks wise, it appears to be the same one. So this has a lot of the uh, uh, same specs as the uh, uh, you know the MetaQuest uh, Pro, right? So the pricing on this, uh, I mean, has to be I, again. It's a Discover device. You, it's a dev kit at this point, right? It looks super cool, uh, but I have a feeling you're going to be paying uh, for 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 the looks there. I mean, it's wireless, though. I'll give it that, even though it's, it is it is just a concept. It does make you look a little like Jordi LaForge when you're wearing it, you know? So I'm curious what the final design might end up being. But XDA developer, XDA was, like, really excited about it. Uh, they were the only ones who actually got their hands on it. So uh, that that outlet is usually a little harder to impress. So I, I, I'm like, okay, there must, be, there must be something there. Good job, Xiaomi. Uh, finally, OnePlus showed off a OnePlus 11 concept phone, which features active cryoflux. <laughs> that's not a sci-fi term. Uh, it's their term for a liquid cooling system uh, that's visible and lit up through the phone's transparent back. Uh, it uses a piezoelectric ceramic micro pump. Uh, to push the water through. So they said it didn't really feel like extra heavy for a phone. OnePlus says the system lowered the system on a chip temps by 2.1 degrees Celsius with three to four frame per second improvements in some titles. Not a lot, but you know, when you're playing on a phone, could be noticeable. Yeah, we've seen like uh, Asus's ROG phones have external water coolers that you can kind of hook up and they run actually through the phone. But I mean, cool to see this. And it, I mean, it does look cool. cool. Like I, yeah. I will say it, it cool. does. I know. Cool is the word. Looks cool. Yeah, oh, I was man. thinking that, that how cool it looks. I wonder if that's more so than the actual abilities of it to, to keep your phone from getting from overheating in your pocket. It's 2.1 degrees Celsius cooler. Like so. the, the, you can put a number on it. That's like a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. I haven't done the math, <laughs> but it's a lot. <laughs> Something okay. like that. Yeah. Uh, folks, if you would like to correct our math, uh, you can join in the conversation in our Discord, uh, which you can join by linking your Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Okay, back to a few of the more wide-ranging Mobile World Congress announcements. You know, everybody's getting into the satellite phone connection business. Samsung just announced its own version is coming to its Exynos chip. UK's uh, Bullet announced a rugged smartphone with its own satellite connectivity built in. And Taiwan's MediaTek will show off its version at MWC. Of course, Apple most famously built it into its last iPhone. Now, Apple uses Qualcomm's hardware and operates its own service through a deal with GlobalStar. Qualcomm announced its own service on the Iridium network to go with its hardware, in case you don't want to roll your own like Apple did. And now it's expanding that service. So Snapdragon satellite integration will come to new phones from nothing, Motorola, Oppo, Vivo, Honor, and Xiaomi. A lot of big uh, phone manufacturers there. Snapdragon satellite will be available on all upcoming 5G modem, RF systems, and Snapdragon mobile platform tiers. Basically, what that means, it's not just coming to phone chips. We're going to be seeing this in the automotive and IoT chip markets as well, and given, you know, a uh, Qualcomm's presence there, uh, that's a heck of a lot of products that that's coming to. I mean, yeah, you know, one, Tom, one what do way you to think? Yeah, one way to think about this is uh, Qualcomm's Snapdragon satellite integration is the Android to Apple's iOS satellite integration, right? It's Snapdragon satellite is available for any manufacturer, whereas Apple makes their own and only uses it themselves, even though they're both running on Qualcomm hardware. But the fact that we're also seeing Exynos, the fact that we're seeing Bullet, we're, we're seeing other hardware makers, makes me wonder, like, this is not going to stick around just as an emergency service uh, forever. They, as these companies get better and as you get things in orbit that aren't just Iridium and Global Star that can do satellite internet connections, I think we're going to see satellite internet built into phones in a really interesting way. This, this is an emerging trend I want to keep an eye on. Satellite phones have been around for a long time, but I think that this is actually bringing it to the masses to where everyone 
now has a phone that eventually will be able to connect to the internet, do something regardless of your location. That's actually kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, like the, the whole idea that this is also like a space story, right? This is, we, we have more satellites that can do more things in orbit. And because of that, now we're building business models on the ground that enable like on a consumer level, an approachable consumer level. Cause you're right. Satellite phones have been around for forever, Rob, I, 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 like on a mass consumer level to, to hit something for as vital as emergency services, but also, you know, just for places where your signal just kind of stinks eventually uh, is very exciting. Yeah. Uh, if this can somehow work through Iridium and Global Star to connect with, you know, like on the backhaul to Starlink or OneWeb or something. And like you say, Rob, we, we just end up having internet in our phone anywhere we like literally anywhere not not just in, you know most places in the country uh but literally everywhere i think i think that will be very interesting to watch now you may or may not have heard of twilio but you probably use something that runs on it it's web apis power a lot of stuff uh, text messages from businesses, phone calls, other comm functions. If you've gotten a text message confirming an order or telling you your delivery is on its way, good chance it was provided using a Twilio API. So it's interesting to note a similar effort from the GSM Association, the GSMA, called Open Gateway. It will provide a framework for universal open source based APIs in carrier networks for developers. So it's not exactly a competitor to Twilio, it's making it so that you can do more things like Twilio did in other arenas. 21 carriers are signed up at launch, including Verizon, Vodafone, Orange, Barty, Airtel, China Mobile, Deutsche Telekom, KT, uh, AT&T. All the participating carriers have signed a memorandum of understanding to work on these APIs through an open source project called Camera, C-A-M-A-R-A, -A -A, which is co-developed by the GSMA and the Linux Foundation. So this is an open platform for developers, which is very good news. And AWS and Microsoft Azure are the first two big cloud providers that are going to provide the access to Open Gateway. Uh, it's not exactly a Twilio replacement. Uh, in fact, it's going to make some things like location and identity verification or carrier billing cheaper and easier to do than they are now. There are no APIs live yet, but the announcement sets out API specs for eight services. So at the beginning, they're going to do SIM swaps. Uh, legal ones, uh, SM two factor <laughs> authentication, carrier billing, device location, among a couple others. AWS and Azure are carrying out uh, that backhaul. And the idea is that by providing these APIs, not only will it make some things easier for carriers, but developers will create apps and services that will increase 5G usage and business. So, you know, it's the it's the killer app theory. So somebody's going to use this to make something that's going to make you want to use 5G. Uh, and yes, the buzzwords immersive mixed reality experiences and Web3 applications were used as examples. Uh, whether those end up being the examples or not, I don't know. But that's how excited the people got when they talked about it. Rob, what do you what do you what do well, you make the, of this? The cool things about the, the, these are APIs. So the, these programming interfaces are going to make it easier theoretically for pretty much developers to create things that can interoperate with each other. They, they don't have to go and build everything from scratch. There's right. a, you know, a, there, there's a platform or a framework out there that you can pull from that, you know, how it works, you know, how it's going to operate. You, you know, there, there's going to be, you know, the more people that use it, the more you're going to actually, uh, you know, be able to garner from what other people have gone before you have done. And it just, it, it just allows you to create really, really cool, Things. We don't know what's going to come from this, but no, I would yeah. imagine it's going to be really cool stuff eventually. But you don't, Twilio had to do a lot of work to make Twilio. If Twilio right. were starting now, this might make it easier. I, I do wonder if this will enable like more, I, I almost want to say like mom and pop, like virtual, like, uh, you know, virtual networks, almost like if you have all of these API services, as long as you're paying to use them and you're paying for the, you know, the carriage on, uh, you know, to, to use the 5G network or whatever like that, like that's what excites me about this is all of this stuff is interesting off the bat, other than them calling it SIM swapping, which from a security standpoint. It, it's what it's called. It's just, as, I, I uh, as, it's as just, Willie it's Scott said in the chat, it's sad that we have to clarify that. <laughs> we mean the but, legal stuff. but like, yeah, some kind of mobile virtual network, like down the line that could just be very easily, like Rob, like you were saying, like these are standards. You can just build off of these. They're part of the terms of service, potentially like down the road. Like that is, that is what is exciting to me uh, of kind of just creating these, uh, you know, whole new entities is kind of fun. All right, we got one more big announcement, right? 
Right, so Google announced new features across Android, Chrome OS, and Chrome. Fast pair support will soon come to Chrome OS, letting users add Bluetooth headphones with a tap and automatically connect the devices already set up on Android. Android will soon get Google Keep's single note widget to let you check off the do list right from the home screen. Where OS will also get a new Keep shortcut to allow you to create to do's um, on the watch face. Where OS will get a mono audio mode, color correction, and grayscale modes to improve accessibility. And the latest Chrome beta now supports users increasing page content size up to 300% while still preserving page layouts. I think that the the Chrome content size thing is going to be like the closed captioning for the web, where at some point everyone's just going to realize everyone is doing that all the time. And then we're all just going to be like, oh, that's like just like the best way to do it. And it's not going to break the page. I think that's a great win. But as a Google Keep user, the fact that Google did something to remind me that they haven't forgotten that Keep exists and they aren't going to immediately kill it because I kind of like it, but I wish it could be so much better. Rob, I think we're in the same boat here, right? Right. Absolutely. It's just, just the fact that they, they're still keeping it around because Google, you know, will kill stuff right quick and in a hurry. Uh, they're still keeping it around and it's actually more usable or will be more usable tomorrow than it is today. So yeah, um, build, build into the ecosystem, please. Just keep it alive that way. All right, folks, uh, we set ourselves up for a, a hard job, which is to cover uh, the entire planet with tech news. Uh, if you want to do it right, you just pick the area you're in, like Nate Langson did. Uh, Nate and Ian are doing text message if you want a UK perspective on the tech news. And Nate is back to share what's going on with UK encryption law on the next text message. Long time no speak, everyone. Thanks for having me back. And this week, we have talked quite extensively about Signal's threat to leave the UK if Britain passes an extremely controversial law over here that would prevent, essentially, encrypted messaging products from being legally operated. So we've talked about how that might even work. What could the implications be for larger messaging apps like Meta's, WhatsApp and others? And you can find that conversation alongside all of our shows at UKTechShow.com. And we would love, 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 love to have you listen. Thanks, guys. I just did. And I can highly recommend this episode. Go check it out, folks. UKTechShow.com. Thank you, Nate. Let's check out the mailbag. We talked previously about how some Major League Soccer games would be broadcast on TV, even though Apple has the streaming rights. So Andy in Montreal wondered if that meant you could stream the ones on TV through the broadcast partner streaming apps. He said the TSN channels are using the American Fox feeds and you can stream from TS the TSN app. Now, that being said, most of the games will not be on TV, so it's probably still going to be worth it for folks to get the Apple TV Plus service if they want all their favorite team's games. But, you know, good to keep in mind. Thanks, Andy, for, for writing in. Yeah, th and th thanks for running that down, too. And Because uh, he was writing and I was like, okay, so, but is TSN letting you stream them? Because I'm like, I'm not sure if Fox is letting you stream them. Is, is Apple locking that down? I'm like, no. If the broadcast network gets to simulcast, then they get to stream it as well. Um, but you don't get all the games. So that's it's, it doesn't take away Apple's apple's advantage there uh well rob dunwood thank you so much uh for being with us i know you have two very good shows that i very much enjoy tell folks about where they can find them and what they are well yeah you can check me out at smrpodcast.com where it's a couple of buddies of mine where we just get on and talk about tech like we would normally talk about sports and football um, and then also, you know, I've always said that I love to talk about tech. I wish I could do it every day. So if you want to hear me again later today, come over and check us out on the Tech John because I'm recording that right after we get done recording here. And uh, the Tech John is a weekly tech show where we actually cover um, technology from a diverse perspective. So all of the hosts are African Americans. We've all been doing this for 20 years or more. So uh, we, we actually kind of bring up the stories because tech really hits differently in our community. Yeah, no, and you do a great job. It's a, it's a great show. I, I really enjoy it. And thanks also to our brand new boss, Patrick, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank yeah. you, Patrick. Patrick. Uh, man, 
uh, we've been on a run. Don't let it end. If you've been on the fence and you want to be a hero, uh, become a patron. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Keep that streak going. Uh, in fact, if you are a patron like Patrick, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, we got Apple leaks from both Ming-Chi Kuo and Mark Gurman on the same day. Two of the most reliable Apple leakers. Uh, reprieve for the iPhone SE and the fact that you might not need an iPhone at all if you want to use Apple's upcoming mixed reality headset. We're going to discuss that. Patrons, stick around. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about password managers with Rod Simmons. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>